so as usual, all the slides begin with these Creative Commons notes about uh, fair use and share and share alike with the uh, slides and the software. So what we're going to do now, uh, and we're, I guess, running about 20, 25 minutes ahead of schedule, but uh, we're going to probably need that extra time for module four. So right now we're in module two. We're going to be uh, doing decision trees, and this is a combination of both a lecture and a lab. So it's going to be about an hour and a half long, um, and then we'll give you guys about a 40, 45 minute break um, for a late lunch for some of you, uh, a regular lunch for some of us on the West Coast here. Um, so again, just uh, highlight, we're talking about decision trees here, a little bit of an introduction. And the reason why decision trees are useful because they are used in classification. And classification is something that's frequently um, done in, in machine learning. And we're gonna show you some examples of classification. And this would be classifying nominal or categorical data. You can also use decision trees slash um, random forest um, to do regression as well, which we'll talk about tomorrow. So we're gonna talk a little bit about classification and clustering. Then we're gonna introduce you guys to decision trees in machine learning and to introduce you to the concept of uh, entropy, uh, normally called Shannon entropy, and the Gini index. Um, these are both measures of information that is used uh, to evaluate and make decisions as part of a decision tree optimization. We're gonna talk a little bit about feature selection, and then we're gonna introduce you to a classic problem that's widely done to um, help people understand the basics of, of, of both decision trees and machine learning. And this is called the iris classification problem. Irises are flowers. Uh, we'll be looking at um, how to classify them based on their petal and sepal length and width. And then with that problem sort of explained, we're gonna show you the details of the Python code for this particular decision tree. And then we're gonna look at um, other types of data. Um, in uh, using decision trees. And it's also gonna be an important lab because this will be your first chance to sort of uh, fiddle around with CoLab using some real code. And so we'll try and give you a gentle introduction to CoLab and the code. So uh, as advertised, you're gonna talk a little bit about clustering and classification. So clustering and classification are different um, in terms of mathematics and in terms of computing. Many of us will sort of put the two together, but they are fundamentally different. So clustering is essentially a process when you get objects that are logically similar. So they might be similar in shape, similar in color, other properties. And um, what you are doing in clustering is the data is unlabeled. Um, the classes are yet to be defined or yet to be labeled. And it's up to, in this case, maybe an unsupervised tool, an unsupervised machine learning method, an unsupervised statistical method um, to, to maybe perform the logical grouping and therefore the logic uh, helps you then classify or label things. Now classification is done where you have advanced knowledge or prior knowledge. Um, and where the labeled objects, so you know now the sock is labeled as a sock or the red ball is labeled as a red ball. Um, so some, some label that you've given or some all-knowing being has given about the object's properties or characteristics. And so these are categories based on their properties. So clustering is done without labels, classification is done with labels. So therefore clustering is fundamentally different than classification. Classification is typical of supervised learning. Clustering is more typical of unsupervised learning. So in supervised learning, we're trying, or supervised machine learning, we're trying to focus on using algorithms that learn how to um, both assign or group things according to class labels. So the reason why we're introducing decision trees as essentially our first example is because they are the simplest of all machine learning algorithms. They're generally simple to understand. 
that are simple to implement. Um, it's a useful method for both classification and regression. With a decision tree, the computer, the model, learns to split or categorize or regress the data based on a series of decisions, usually yes or no, greater than or less than if it's numeric data, and um, essentially some inherent knowledge about the cost of those decisions. So in the case on the right, survival is a measure of cost. If you survive, that's good. If you don't survive, that's bad. As I'd mentioned before, uh, decision trees uh, have this structure where there are um, edges, which are the uh, lines or arrows that connect the boxes. The boxes are the leaves or the nodes. So the survival of passengers in the Titanic, um, we have a, a root node, which is the top, which is gender. And if you are male or female, it decides key deciding factor whether you survived or not. Um, after gender was a section on age, um, a node, and how young or old you were. So if you're older than nine and a half, you died. If you were younger than nine and a half, you generally lived. But then among those who were younger than nine and a half, if you had um, fewer um, siblings, or spouses associated with you, um, then you generally survived. If you had a large family, it wasn't good news. So this is the decision tree that was learned from survivor data from the Titanic manifest. Uh, it wasn't the decision tree that the captain or the crew used, um, but there was clearly some decisions that were made about women and children first. Um, so the decision tree has a formal definition. It's a, technically a flow chart and the nodes, the boxes or circles are tests on an attribute. Um, so what's the age? What's the gender? How many siblings? And then the branches or the edges are the outcome of, of, of those tests, um, the decisions. The paths from the root, which is the top node or the top box, to the final boxes um, are essentially the classification rules. So we make decision trees all the time. Flow charts are drawn all the time. So this is why decision trees are essentially intuitive to understand. But to write a program that makes a decision tree is not totally trivial. Now, in the case of decision trees, we talk about classification or regression. So classification is to essentially classify objects, to predict classes or categorical values. Regression predicts continuous values. So that's like linear regression, plotting a line or nonlinear regression. So fitting your data. So classification works with essentially nominal or categorical data. Regression works with numeric values. Um, decision trees are formally called classification and regression trees or CARTs, C-A-R-T. So when you're building a decision tree, <coughs> you're trying to decide on which features to choose and which conditions to choose among the splitting. So, you know, there are many features, obviously, among passengers in the Titanic. You know, gender and age were obvious ones, but they could have chosen on clothing or uh, first class and second class and third class. They could have chosen eye color or hair color. Um, any of those things could have been deciding factors. Um, but also within a decision tree, you have to make a decision on when to stop. Uh, eventually splitting things, as they say, splitting hairs becomes kind of useless. So if they're, you're not separating any objects anymore, then there's no point introducing any more decisions. So the nodes, as I said, are these decision rules um, or condition rules. So in the case of, is this individual male or female, um, there's a yes or no. Um, the green and red 
boxes uh, essentially are leaf nodes, uh, which indicates sort of a fate. And then the uh, edges, again, are the paths. So if you take one path, then you hit another decision rule. And then you take another path, then you make another decision rule. So the choice of whether it was male or female, I mean, that's pretty binary. But in terms of the age, this is where it's no longer categorical. It's, it's numeric. So should the age be greater than 10, greater than 9, greater than 9 and a half? Similarly, the number of siblings and spouses, is there more than two and a half or less than two and a half? Or should it be more than three or less than three? Those numbers um, are what are determined uh, by training on the data and also by testing on the data. So in decision trees, they use a lot of terminology similar to a tree. So there is a root. Um, now the root in the decision tree is at the top of the tree, whereas in real trees, the root is at the bottom. Um, the root node usually represents the entire population of the sample set. Um, and eventually that root is divided into two or more homogeneous sets. Splitting is a term we use in decision tree um, theory is essentially dividing a node into two or more subnodes. Um, when a subnode splits into further subnodes, it's called a decision node. So technically all the nodes except for the terminal nodes are decision nodes. A terminal node um, is one that doesn't split. It's the one where no more decisions need to be made. That's a final grouping. Um, obviously, if a person has died in the Titanic, then you can't sort of uh, separate between dead and really dead or something like that. It's just, it's a terminal node. Um, there's also a parent and child node, and that's where, uh, that's um, when the parent node is the node above multiple child nodes. Subnodes are considered child nodes. Um, so there are advantages and disadvantages to decision trees. As a rule, because decision trees are something that we do all the time in life, they're pretty easy to understand and they're, inter and they're interpretable. Technically, they're called white box models, whereas things like neural nets or deep neural nets and even hidden Markov models to some extent are called black box models because they're really hard to understand. So it's possible to write out a decision tree as a series of sentences or as a paragraph. And people can understand that even if they're not mathematically inclined. Decision trees can handle both numeric and categorical or nominal data. So we have the case of male, female, that's categorical, and then age, nine and a half, greater or less, that's numeric. The data can basically be brought in as is. Um, it mirrors obviously our own ways of thinking. It has essentially a form of feature selection that, that's built into the process. So you don't have to do prior lasso feature generation or things like that. And the other thing is you actually don't have to normalize the data or transform it. Um, you recall where I talked about the need for transforming or normalizing data. And that's particularly true for um, neural networks and, and other kinds of data. But decision trees, you don't have to do that. Now, there are disadvantages with decision trees. Um, they're not the most robust. Um, they can be susceptible to um, small changes in your training data set, training size. Although there are tricks called bagging and boosting that can fix this. Uh, it's a heuristic method, so it's not as mathematically robust as, say, uh, neural nets are. There is a tendency to overfit, but again, if you do your proper testing and validation, then that's not an issue. Um, the decision tree algorithm is called a greedy algorithm. Uh, it's not the one to give you the best solution, but random forests, which are a combination of um, trees, which is sort of a consensus tree, those essentially fix the problem of, of optimal solutions. Um, there's also some inherent bias when you have more and more categorical levels. So this is also a, a weakness with decision trees. So I'm going to show you how to learn a decision tree. And so the term learning is sort of how to create the model. And this is the, the, the language that machine learning specialists talk about. 
So the most common algorithm is called reverse, re, re, recursive binary splitting or RBS or iterative dichotomization. And the iterative dichotomization algorithm went through three rounds, ID1, which was improved to ID2, which was improved finally to ID3. And so ID3 is the current algorithm that's used by just about everyone. Um, in this ID3 RBS method, all the features that are in your table uh, are considered and different split points are tried and tested using a certain cost function. And I'll talk about the cost function a little bit later um, in more detail. So the, the split um, is as you try all these, or as you iterate through this, the, the splitting between left and right with the lowest cost, um, so that would be in the Gini index, or the highest information gain, that's the Shannon entropy, is the one that's selected. Um, if there are three different features that we're looking at it, so it might be age, gender, and uh, number of siblings and spouses, um, then uh, you have three features, therefore there are three possible splits. Um, so you're going to consider, consider age, which gives you the best split in terms of uh, the information gain. You're going to consider um, uh, gender, you're going to consider siblings and spouses, and find out which one gives you either the highest uh, cost or highest information, lowest cost or highest information gain. And in our case, at least with the Titanic um, survivors case, gender actually turns out to be the one with the highest information gain or the lowest cost um, in terms of what's called the Gini index. And then the next one is age, and then the next one is siblings and spouses. So those three features are sort of sequentially ordered based on uh, their quality in terms of predicting who survived and who didn't. So um, in terms of information gain, um, this is something that's based on a concept called Shannon entropy. Um, some of you may have heard this before. It's relevant for information theory. It's also used in sequence motif evaluation. Um, it's a measure of uh, uncertainty or disorder um, where PI is the probability of being in class I. So it's PI times a log base two of the PI. And you're summing over all of the classes where C is class. So um, by summing over all of these probabilities, you can calculate um, the Shannon entropy. Because you're taking a log, it's kind of, it takes a little bit more time on a computer. Then information gain is the difference between the entropy in the data set um, and the collection of all the entropies in the feature. So it might be the entropy of the parent minus entropy of the child sets uh, as you break out or split it out. Um, generally, it's the split with the maximum information gain is the one that's the, the root. And then sequentially, the ones with uh, other high information gains through a split are also then Nearer, nearer the route, and then it progresses as you get to less and less information gain as you go down the tree. So probabilities, uh, by definition, have to be less than one. So you know, a 90% probability or 0.9, a 10% probability or 0.1. Um, the log of these numbers, because they're less than one, means that the, the log will be negative. So you have to put a negative sign to make sure that the numbers are positive. Um, if you have a two-class situation, which means you're splitting into two classes, the entropy, the maximum entropy is one. If you're four classes, the maximum entropy is two, and so on. And this is just showing you the calculation. So two classes, you sum over class one and class two. Um, the probabilities are one half of being in one or the other. So one half log base two of one half gives you uh, one half plus one half. Um, which gives you a total of one. So here's an example where we have um, different features. Um, 
three features here and um, observations about cars. So this is no longer this is a situation for survivors, but this is just one that we grabbed from the web, which is a good one. Age, the age of the car, the mileage, number of miles on the odometer, and then whether it has been road tested, whether someone's taken it out for a spin and, and found it to work. Um, and so based on the features of whether it's old or new, high or low mileage or road tested, there were decisions about whether to buy or not to buy. Um, so those represent observations. So there's features, which are the columns, observations, which are the rows. So we can calculate um, essentially this decision of buy, not to buy, instead of a two case scenario. Um, there are four um, decisions in total. And so we can calculate the entropy of the root node, which is the buy or not to buy, um, by taking the probability account of the number that we bought and the number of the total examples. So we, we suggest two out of four should be bought. So P uh, for buy or PI for buy is 0.5. PI for not to buy is also 0.5. Um, so if we plug that into the entropy formula for Shannon, uh, and if we remember that log two of 0.5 is, is minus one, log two of one is zero, uh, we can see how the entropy adds to one and a half or half plus a half gives you one. So we've calculated the entropy for, in this case, the root node. Now we're going to distinguish between, uh, and then this is where we would iteratively assess which ones have the best information gain. Um, should is, is age more useful? Is mileage more useful? Is road testing more useful in order to make the decision to buy? So what we're going to do is look at each of those three features, age first, then mileage, then road tested. And we're going to evaluate their information gain or entropy first and then their information gain. So in this case, if we look at age, there were again four choices. Um, there were two instances where the recent age was used, one instance where uh, recent age was a recommendation not to buy. In the case of old, there were no cases where we suggested to buy and a case of old um, um, where again, it was just don't buy. So we can plug in uh, based on the, the ratios uh, for the recent. So the probability um, for uh, recent would be uh, 0.666, that's PI, so that's two out of three, two instances out of the three there we had a check mark. Um, and then um, in terms of um, not to buy, it was one out of three. Um, so uh, we'd use 0.33. So the recent entropy, uh, the calculation is shown at the bottom and you can see all the decimal places and the multiplication and we come up with a number, the entropy is 0.918. In the case of old, it's a simpler calculation. Um, there's uh, uh, an instance of one uh, and then there's also the one of log two of zero. So it's not worth calculating, but P log P is one log two of one, log two of one is zero. Um, so we calculate an entropy for the old case of zero. So how do we determine um, the information gain? So the information gain is determined from the entropy or weighted entropy of the child nodes. And those are the entropies, one of 0.918 and the other one is 0, 0.0. Uh, in the case of the separation, um, there were three instances out of four um, that had uh, that were part of recent and one instance out of four that were part of old. So we weight the first one by three quarters and the second one, so left node by three quarters, the right one by one quarter. We do the math and we get an, a weighted average of the entropy of 0.688. And then we do the subtraction. The parent node had an entropy of one the child, average child nodes had an entropy of 0.688. So the information gain in terms of age is 0.31.
So again, it's a fairly detailed calculation and we're trying to estimate the information gain of which one is more useful. Is age, is mileage, is road tested? So let's look at the one for mileage now. We're gonna calculate this again. So there are uh, two instances where low mileage um, um, were either buy or don't buy and two instances of high mileage of buy or don't buy. So the net effect is that at least you can probably tell that there's um, uh, mileage doesn't seem to be making a whole lot of difference in terms of decisions of buying or not buying. Uh, we can calculate the entropy for low mileage um, and that's calculated at the bottom. We can calculate the entropy for the high mileage. And in both cases, the information um, is one uh, for both low and high. And we can also calculate the entropy gain or the information gain. And so we can calculate the average, uh, two out of four instances times one plus two out of four instances plus one. So that was their average child entropy. And so the root node had an entropy of one, the child node had an entropy of one, one minus one, the total information gain is zero. So basically it's saying mileage tells you nothing. It doesn't help you determine whether you're to buy or not to buy. On the other hand, age, because information gain wasn't zero, it does tell you something. It suggests to you that um, you know, probably a recent um, car is probably better to buy. Okay, we've looked at age, we've looked at mileage, let's look at road testing. So in this case, um, there are two instances where we said buy because it was road tested. And then in terms of if it wasn't road tested, it was two instances of don't buy. So road test, yes, road test, no. Um, so we can calculate again the entropy for, for these ones. And, and as it turns out, the entropy um, is zero for road testing, both yes, road testing and no road testing. So the average child entropy uh, for those two nodes is zero plus zero. And so the information gain is one minus zero, uh, the entropy of the parent minus the entropy of the children. So that means that in terms of information gain, road testing has the most information. It's the most informative about whether to buy or not to buy. Um, so recall that the mileage had a, an information gain of zero, age had an information gain of 0.31. So we've now done our calculation, and, and this is you know, trying to choose which, which node or which decision rule should be followed first from the root node. And uh, we've looked at age, we looked at mileage, we looked at road testing. We calculate the one that has the maximum information gain, road test does. So that one becomes our next uh, node, or if you want the decision rule. So this essentially becomes um, um, road test as the, as the root node. Yes, uh, two instances, no road testing, um, two instances. And so we can get uh, a clear separation. And in fact, this decision tree <laughs> um, boils down to this, just this very simple architecture. Um, start with a collection of the four vehicles, was it road tested or not? Yes, no. And they both lead to sort of terminal nodes. You don't need to do any more decision trees because you've determined what's the best route to decide to buy or not to buy. Um, so this algorithm could potentially be used in all future cases of when people are trying to decide to buy cars. Um, just do they do a road test? Don't look at whether it's, um, don't look at the mileage, don't look at the age. Now this is pretty naive, this is not how most people buy cars, but as I say, this is an example. Now the Shannon entropy um, is one where I think there's more useful data. It's, it's typically used more often in um, decision trees, it's more logical. But if in the case where you have lots of data, lots of numbers, and in our case, not a lot of time, we can use the Gini index as another measure of um, classification probability. So the Gini index is initially used as a way of, of separating um, 
wealthy countries or the wealth uh, disparities between um, different countries. Um, so it was a sociology thing, but then emerged to become something that's quite useful for um, classification. It looks a little bit like um, the um, entropy. Um, it's just that it's not log anymore. It's just um, P squared. Um, so a Gini index has to be a number between zero and one, not unlike information gain, which also has to be between zero and one. Um, the Gini index is given a, a abbreviation GI, whereas information in gain is given uh, the abbreviation is IG. Um, the Gini index has a zero value when everything is in the same class um, and uh, an index of one when things are randomly distributed across very uh, various classes. So when there's sort of in the case of extreme wealth uh, inequality, um, the Gini index closer to zero when they talk about equal wealth across all groups, uh, the Gini index is typically one. So just like with um, the entropy, um, PI is the probability of being in class I. Um, so it's the same, same meaning. In terms of calculations, uh, calculating a log is computationally expensive, but calculating the square of a probability is computationally fast. So um, the Gini index is, is faster to calculate. Um, and then in the case of Gini indices, it's the low number that's best, whereas in information gain, it's the high number that's best in terms of choosing the root. So you can choose either information gain or Gini index. Uh, these are the ones that are essentially do your feature selection. They're the ones that, as I say, decided whether you should use mileage or uh, age or um, road testing. The, or in the case of the Titanic, it was uh, gender, age, and number of siblings. So high information gain, or low Gini index. Those are the ones that are decided in how you choose your features. Those are the ones that become the root nodes or then the subsequent decision nodes as you go down the tree. This selection of features, this natural way of selecting features is a way of essentially reducing the amount of data. And I, I, I talked to you earlier about this idea of feature selection. And it's really important. Um, the nice thing about decision trees is that the feature selection is sort of an inherent part of it. Um, you can also, um, as you perform the decision tree as, as things that are um, removed from the root node that are no longer considered, um, that's essentially a way of pruning your tree. And I'll talk about that a little later. Entropy and Gini, uh, the formulas are a little different, but this just plots out um, their sort of characteristic versus what's called the impurity index. Um, but um, they have basically the same shape. Um, the entropy is just a little broader than the Gini index. And so mathematically, they're so similar. Uh, there's not much to distinguish them in terms of their utility. So that's, that's why you can use both. Uh, the Gini index has the advantage of it's um, faster to calculate. Now, pruning was something I just mentioned, and, and on the right is just sort of a picture of what happens when you prune a tree. So pruning in reality means you're cutting off branches, sort of thins out the tree. Um, a thinned out tree um, usually looks a little better uh, if you're an arborist, but um, in the case of decision trees, it actually improves their performance. It, it helps eliminate problems of overfitting. And it also reduces the complexity of the decision tree. I think you guys are probably hearing some background noise. So that's the buzzsaw that's slowly demolishing our um, kitchen up here. So hopefully I'll try and speak louder uh, so you guys can hear me over the sound in the back. Um, so in terms of pruning, um, there are different methods that are used. Weakest link pruning, reduced error pruning. We're not gonna go into them very much here, but those are available uh, for sort of more advanced decision trees. Um, 
this is just again a picture in terms of how uh, feature selection is inherently done with decision trees um, when we're sort of calculating the root nodes or the subsequent nodes that will be considered as decision nodes we're always doing uh, information gain calculations or gene index calculations here i'm just showing uh, the different colored features um, they could be colors they could be age they could be gender they could be siblings they could be mileage, whatever features we're considering. Uh, I've crossed out the features, the ones that had the lowest information gain, and the ones that had reasonably high information gain, those are the ones that are going to be kept. So in the case of, um, let's say, the Titanic data set, um, we could have done a selection early on and said, what was the information gain in terms of, you know, if we included hair color and eye color and uh, first class and second class passengers. So that may have been done for this particular study, and so this may have allowed them to um, reduce the initial set of features just to these three, gender, age, and siblings. Um, and that's why they were able to come up with a fairly simple and robust decision tree for predicting Titanic survivors. So this is how uh, the data uh, was tabulated uh, from the passenger list or manifest. So there are 1,317 people in uh, the Titanic when it set sail. Uh, they identify who survived. Um, and that's sort of the, that's the, that's the decision issue where that's the thing that you're trying to predict. Um, and then they had information about whether they're men or women, male or female, their age, and then how many members in the family. So that include both the siblings and, and if there is a spouse. So you can see some had the family size of five, some had a family size of, of just one, so it was just an individual. Um, so um, these cases here, obviously, because we're trying to predict survivorship, that's a useful label. And then the qualities um, or characteristics of the passengers, gender, age, and sip size are also useful features. Now, here's a table where there's a, a useless feature. This is the zodiac sign. So we have the um, zodiac that sign that these people, and we put it in a numeric form. So we've converted Sagittarius to 12s and who knows whatever. And so all of these things are associated with their, their birth date and their zodiac sign. Um, so these are indicated uh, along with sip size, age, and, and male, female. And if we did do an information gain, um, we would probably find that the zodiac sign had no information gain whatsoever about who survived. And so in that regard, zodiac sign is considered a useless feature. And here's the, the um, information gainer, or um, in this case, I guess it was the uh, genie index, actually. Um, so uh, in the genie index, low numbers win, high numbers lose. Uh, information gain, high numbers win, low numbers lose. So the Gini index in this case um, was hovering between 0.11 and 0.28 for sib size, male, female, whereas the Gini index for the zodiac sign was 0.98. So not useful. So this is essentially we've, we've done through our calculation of information gain, um, essentially some feature selection. Now, the RBS or ID3 algorithm in principle could go ad infinitum. Um, so you have to have a way of stopping or um, preventing it from going forever. Uh, so there's certain rules that you can have. You can have the minimum number of affected objects. Uh, so if you have just one object left in a decision uh, node or zero objects, then basically there's no point making a decision. Uh, you can also have a sort of a depth. Um, you can see on the tree on the right where the tree has first with this maybe a couple leaves, then four leaves, and then I don't know, about 30 leaves. That um, is sort of the depth or the longest path or the length of the longest path from the root. So, a lot of people just choose a, a number, maybe a depth of five, a depth of four. Um, the depth should be a, a fraction of the total number of features. So um, in the case of the um, Titanic, uh, we had uh, three features they were considering. 
um, after we've done feature selection, and we basically went to a depth of about three. So it shouldn't be a case where the depth is more than the features, it gets redundant. Uh, at some level, with the original Titanic data, there were probably about 50 different features considered. And so from the initial set of 50, it went down to just three. And so in that regard, it's the depth um, is a fraction of the total number of features. So that's sort of a backgrounder in terms of how we make decisions about when to say split or which feature is relevant or not relevant and how we use either information gain or Gini index and how that is, is used to build up the essentially the algorithm or the model to, to, to produce a generalized um, decision tree. So of course with the Titanic decision tree, um, they could say, okay, um, you know, the next time we have a large ship that's about to hit an iceberg, let's pull out this decision tree so we can decide you know, who should live uh, so that we follow, you know, I guess the best rules or best practices. Um, if you're buying a car, you pull out this decision tree that you've made, which is, you know, choose the one that you've test driven. Now, again, they're kind of silly uh, in the sense that they're, they're not really intended to be predictive. Um, but that's the point is you create a decision tree on some training data, you test it, and then if it's robust, then it can be used for performing future classifications. So the Titanic one is, would be the one used by uh, captains whenever they're sailing ships. So in this uh, machine learning workflow, uh, we're going to follow the six step process. You know, define your problem, propose a solution or a rough solution, then you're going to construct your data set, you're going to transform your data set, select features, you're going to choose a model to train it, test it, and then use this to make future predictions on new examples. So the one we're going to do here, which is a little more realistic rather than the Titanic survivors or choosing a car, is iris classification. So iris flowers, how do you distinguish them between different species? So if you're a botanist, this is really interesting. If you're not, it's, uh, I guess, a trivial example that shows you how decision trees work. <clears throat> so that's our problem. How do we classify flowers based on their color and shape? And next is, well, we need a training set to sort of test. So where, where do we get this data set? So this data set actually came out uh, in 1936 uh, by a famous statistician named Ronald Fisher. Fisher exact t-test, as some of you might have heard of. So he's done lots of statistical work or did lots of statistical work. And he also pioneered the concept of linear discriminant analysis or LDA, uh, which is a precursor to partial least guard discriminant analysis. Um, and it's also sort of a precursor to regression. So the data set, which is used by many, many people around the world as a test set, uh, it has 50 samples of three different iris species, iris setosa, virginica, and versicolor. Pictures of versicolor, virginica, and setosa are shown below. So setosa is a, an iris flower which has very small petals and very small sepals. Um, versicolor has very big petals um, and relatively big sepals, as does virginica. Um, although I think Virginica has smaller, uh, smaller petals than, than uh, Versicolor. What you can do, uh, they're all purple irises, so color doesn't help. But what you have to do is then look at um, the length and width of the sepals, um, which are the wider petals, and then the conventional petals, which look more like leaves. And by looking at the sepal and petal dimensions, length and width, you should be able to classify them according to their, their species. So this is actually from the paper. Uh, so this is maybe a little faded, but th this is the typed up work. It was collected in Quebec uh, by a botanist named Edgar Anderson. Um, Fisher got the data, put this into his paper. And here's the, the four sets of information. So sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, iris, setosa, versicolor, and virginica. Um, and you can see right away, you don't have to be a computer, um, that the setosa has a very, very small petal width and a very, very small petal length. 
relative to uh, Virginica and Versicolor. On the other hand, the sepal length and sepal width are kind of about the same. Um, Virginica is generally longer um, than uh, Versicolor, although they overlap. Um, and likewise, you can probably see a slight trend in terms of petal length with Virginica being slightly longer than Versicolor. So as I say, you don't have to be a genius to sort of figure out how things will separate here, but the fact that you and your eyes and your knowledge of, of a little bit of math can detect the pattern, um, it's a good test then to see if the computer can also detect the pattern. So we have this data set of 150 flowers times four dimensions, sepal, petal, length, and width. Uh, we're gonna then um, transform our data set um, so this is the best way to formulate the data. Um, so we have, um, in terms of uh, columns, there are five columns. So we've got species, uh, Setosa, Versicolor, Virginica, we've labeled them. I'm not putting all 150 here or 50 times three, uh, but now we've also separated the petal and sepal length. So those are in columns um, and along with their width. So this is in a format that is very readable and very usable for um, a decision tree or even for neural nets or any other machine learning set. Okay, so we've put our data together. We've done the first three steps of, of the process. So we're now gonna go and, and sort of choose our model. And we've already decided that we're gonna use a de decision tree. We could use a neural net, an SVM, hidden Markov model, any combination of things, but this is a simple data set. It's a modest number for training and testing. So decision tree is probably safe. And you may recall that I said, you know, typically you need a minimum of a thousand data points. Here we're only using, you know, 150. The reason is, is because it's a really simple problem and the separation is very obvious. Um, so in some cases you can use machine learning when the separations are obvious. On the other hand, maybe you don't even need to use machine learning when it's obvious. Um, so this is, as I say, purely for illustration purposes. So if we were to program, and we're not gonna make you program because there's not enough time, but what you would do is you would go to your CoLab website, you'd open the file, uh, you'd select a new notebook, from file, so you're gonna create a new program. Uh, then you'd uh, change your file name to Iris Decision Tree uh, in Python. And then you now have um, text that you can start entering uh, or you can type in, you know, hello world and whatever else. Now, as I say, we don't have time for people to sort of break out into a lab and start coding. Uh, what instead we're doing is giving you uh, the code uh, so it's in module two uh, under the uh, CBW machine learning folder. And you can use either the Python code or you can use the R code. So you have choices. Um, we're gonna work with the Python. Um, and if you click on the Python select code, it'll open up in the Google CoLab. Now it's about a hundred and some lines long and we're gonna try and go through the, the algorithm or the program. And it's broken up into about uh, eight different sections. Um, there's a section where we read the data, um, so the table in the format that I just showed. We're gonna check the data to see if there's any missing data. Then we're gonna create our training and our testing sets. And so this is, we're using sort of the two third, one third rule, two thirds for training, one third for testing. Then we're gonna write a bunch of functions. The functions are gonna do essentially the, the splitting, because that's what a decision tree is. It's making a decision. It's decide left or right, yes or no. Uh, so first of all, we have to do a splitting. Then we have to create a function that calculates the Gini index. We could have also done information gain, but we're using Gini index here. Um, we're gonna try and um, write a, essentially a function that determines the best split. So do you, do you split it nine and a half or do you split it 10? Do you split it nine? Um, and then we also have to have a function that said, when do I stop? Tell me when to stop this 
tree. Uh, and, and so this is a termination node function to say, okay, if you don't have to go any further, you've hit the point where there's no more classes or nothing more to split. And then we actually have to write this, the, the splitting function. So the decision tree itself. And the decision tree function is just called split. Uh, and then to call, um, once we've got the train decision tree, uh, we wanna be able to use it. And so what we've essentially created with the decision tree is a program that could be used uh, if we went back to the Gaspé Peninsula, or if we went out to our backyard and had a whole bunch of viruses and we wanted to figure out what species we have, then we could just type in our information about petal and sepal length and width. And this program will be able to tell us whether it's virginica, setosa, or whatever. So let's go through this. So again, if you were typing the program, um, you would um, invoke or ask that you want to have NumPy and Pandas. And remember, I told you a little bit about NumPy and Pandas. So these are Pandas is used for handling matrices or data frames. NumPy is using um, some nice math operations and for matrix or array handling. So it's just a useful set of functions, library functions. Um, here's the code for reading the data. And so, as I said, this is how it, it looks, or at least the structure of the data in the CSV or text file, where we have the sepal length and width, petal length and width, and the species. And uh, the PD is the pandas. And so we're reading this CSV file. Um, um, we can read it through different um, array markers. Uh, the colon is to indicate the, the end of the file. So once we've read in the data, we want to make sure the data is valid. Um, was there a mistake in the reading? Is there some missing data? Um, so this data check, which you'll see um, in essentially every program we use for the rest of today and tomorrow, is always there. And it's basically to see, is there any missing value? And uh, if it does see something where there is a null, uh, in, in any of the columns, it will indicate there's a missing value in the column. Um, if it sees nothing uh, of, uh, that's unusual, it'll just basically print the note, data set is complete, no missing values. So great. Um, so we've now finished, I guess, if you want, um, collecting your data, selecting, uh, not even quite selecting features, but we're now using our um, ID through your RBS decision tree model. So in this part, um, we now have the data read in. We're going to create the training and the testing set. So we're going to split it out, 70% for training, 30% for testing. And then essentially, we're also going to be doing a, a threefold cross-validation so that we can then randomize that and take another 30, take another 30. Um, so this is the code to split it. Um, and we're just taking a, a, an index. Uh, to, well, first of all, we scramble the data. Um, so we make sure that um, it's, it's sort of randomized. We don't have all of the setosas in one group and all the virginicas in another. Um, randomizing your data is important um, so that uh, it doesn't bias your training set. So once we've randomized the data, uh, then we're going to split it up. And so we've got the length of the array um, and we're going to meet one case multiplying uh, from 0.7 to the beginning and then the other one um, to uh, 0.7 to the end of the array or covering the last 30%. So we've split 70, 30 here. Um, we've also um, just print out the fact that we have uh, created the test and training set. Now, what the essence of, of decision trees, as I highlighted with some of the other, other examples, is to determine which features have the most useful um, uh, either information gain or Gini index. So in this case, we're looking for the one that has the lowest Gini index. And uh, from starting from all samples, um, we could calculate the petal length, petal width, sepal length, sepal length, uh, and which cutoff, you know, three centimeters, two centimeters, five centimeters for each of them, sepal length width, petal length width. 
Turns out if you did this for all of them, you'll find one that works really well. Um, and that's a, a petal length um, and a cutoff of less than or equal to 2.45. That one gives you a Gini index of um, um, 0.665. Um, so the lowest Gini index, remember, is the best. Um, and um, with that Gini index, you can get a separation of the setosas completely. Uh, and then you could group the Versicolor and Virginica together. And so this is shown in the diagram on the right, which is the red uh, showing the setosas, and the Versicolor Virginica, which is on the right. And, and so that one separation based on the petal length alone um, cleans up your data set very nicely. So that's the most powerful separator. And what's more, um, by the time you've separated into Setosa, it's a pure node. So there's no more separation, it's a terminal node. Um, and the next one is a mix of both Versicolor and Virginica. It still has, at least in this case, it's now been partitioned. So it still has a, a lower Gini index than, than the one at the, the root node, but that's because it's already been separated. So this is still a considered, it's called an impure node or a decision node. And so it can still be split further. And what I've shown at the bottom is just essentially what was done when we, we looked at petal length and how the Gini index was calculated. And somewhere around about two and a half, 2.4, you hit your minimum Gini index. But as you went to things that were too low or too high, um, the Gini index started climbing again. So the sweet spot is, is what we found. And that cutoff of 2.45 centimeters is, is the first separation point. So what we're going to do is essentially write code to do that, to do that split calculation. Um, so first of all, we have to be able to uh, identify split points. Um, so we'll just split rows of data given a feature and given a certain cutoff. So this is just a way of testing and saying, OK, what, what happens if I use a uh, petal length of 1.2? What happens if I do 1.3? What happens if I do 1.4? So it's just essentially determining how things split out. Now uh, that I've been able to split data, I now have to calculate the Gini index for each of these different cutoffs or for each of these different split offs. So we're going to have left and right groups. Um, and we're going to use this function called test split a little later. Um, and then we have the different label classes, Virginica, uh, Versicolor, Setosa, and we have the number 0, 1, and 2. Um, and we also have a check just to make sure that we don't perform a Gini index calculation on an empty group. So this is what the code is. It's more, t more comments than code itself, but this is just simply uh, calculating the Gini index. Now, there's a couple parts to this. Um, we have to initialize a score, um, and then we sum them, because remember, the Gini index is a sum. So we've got the probability p squared, and it's 1 minus p squared. So you can see the p times p and the Gini index 1 minus p squared. And then we kind of normalize just based on the size of this. Um, so this returns our Gini in index. So that's the function, and that's the definition of the Gini index. Um, so now that we've got the split um, function or get split, we also have the Gini index um, to calculate, and we have the test split functions. So Gini index and test split are used to get uh, help build the get split function. And the get split function uh, is a bit more code. So we have the top part, the middle part, and the bottom part. Um, so for each feature, we're going to try and find you know, minimum and maximum value. Uh, we're going to increment, in this case, the dimensions of length, petal length, petal width, sepal length, and sepal length width by 0.1 centimeters. So we're going to count by 0.1. Uh, we calculate the Gini index, and as I say, all that's really happening is this calculation is done over all of the petal lengths, all of the sepal lengths, all of the petal widths, and so on. 
Um, so that's the calculation we perform. And after that's done, um, we can decide or we can return our index and the ones with the lowest Gini index uh, are returned. So we can do this Gini index calculation. We can calculate the splitting forever. And so to avoid going into an infinite loop, we have to stop growing the tree. So we have a maximum depth parameter. And that's the number of nodes that we're going to use uh, for this thing. And given that there's just sort of three classes of flowers, then probably the, the depth we would choose is probably just three. Um, we also have to accommodate certain situations, um, which is potentially if the data is not split perfectly, uh, then we have to just use the most common class value in the terminal group. So um, this, we now have all of the functions. We have the Gini index calculation, we have the split calculation, we have the get split calculation, we have um, the node termination function. So all of these have been built out. We've also read in our data, formatted our data. So now we can put all of those functions together to perform the decision tree calculation. And the decision tree is using this function called split and it uses the information from get split. It also breaks things into left nodes and right nodes. Um, and so the full set of code is, is essentially shown in these three sets of slides. And it's recursively calling the split. Um, so as it's going down, we're checking for the depth. We're checking on the left child. Um, uh, if we've reached a maximum depth, we stop the recursive splitting. If the maximum depth hasn't been reached, um, then we go to the left child and, and um, force it to either perform more splitting or if it's too, too few samples, we stop. Um, so we continue splitting on the left side of our tree, and then we also process or split on the right side of our tree. So remember, if you first, you know, the first root node goes to the left and the right. And if the left is not terminated, then we keep on splitting. Um, but then on the right side, uh, if those haven't terminated, we keep on splitting. So we keep on doing running this splitting process until either we've kept the hit the maximum depth or the left and or right child nodes um, have no more data. So there's nothing further to split. So that's the end game for decision tree. So once we've created our decision tree, then it, you can use it. Um, and so the point is obviously once you've got a, a model, um, use the model to help. And, and the intent here is to have a program that could allow you to go out in your backyard or go to the gas bay, measure petal and sepal widths, type it in and it'll automatically identify what the species is. Um, you don't have to remember. Um, anyways, this is essentially the, the prediction or making the prediction um, with a decision tree where it, it essentially takes the paths and returns the uh, information and outputs what's, uh, what's come out. So all of those functions, the reading the data, um, the Gini index calculations, the get split function, the split function, the prediction function uh, is about 123 lines. So there's 91 lines of coding, 32 lines of comment. Um, if you were to run this on Python, it would take about a, a one to two seconds. Um, and if you were to run it on R, about the same period of time. So what you want to do is, is essentially test on your training set. So we could have done three different training sets or one different training set and calculate the average over the, the different training sets. But for the single um, sort of threefold split where we've got 70% training and 30% testing, we're looking at roughly 100 and some uh, examples. And what we can see is um, in terms of ob observe versus predicted, we were able to come up with an algorithm for these hundred or so um, examples where we could perfectly predict which ones were Setosa, 
which ones were virginica and which ones were versicolor. So the diagonal is all ones, the off diagonal elements are all zeros. So that's really good. And that's on our training data set. So we're not done because we now have to assess our performance on our test data set. So that's the 50 or so flowers that we kept out. And we're gonna see how well that does. And so this is the testing on, on our, on our um, validation set or training set. So if we test on our test data set, you'll see that the we, we aren't quite perfect. The diagonal is not 111, it's 11.93. That we get some confusion between Virginica and Versicolor. So we're 93% correct in the Versicolor, but we have a 7% error switching or mi mixing up Versicolor from Virginica. Um, so that still actually is, is okay. Um, and, and this is where um, you want to assess whether you've overtrained or undertrained. And as a rule with the training data, um, you, you generally do slightly better. With the testing data, you'll do slightly worse. And generally you want training and testing data to be within about say five or 6% of each other. Um, and you know, Satosa to Sosa, they're 0%, Virginica to Virginica, they're 0%. Versicolor to Versicolor, they're um, a 7% error. So averaged over all three classes, it's about 2.3%. 2, 2 so you're within um, the allowed error. Um, and it certainly indicates that we have not overtrained our system. So this is, I say, really important. A lot of people forget to do this. They just either evaluate their training data over and over again and say, look, I'm perfect. Uh, but then when they try it on some new data, it looks it's abysmal. So this case, we deliberately said, let's, let's look at how we do on 100 flowers. We do really well. Let's see how we do on a holdout set of 50. And we still do pretty well, about 95, 96% accuracy overall. So we've, we've now generated a, a machine learning model. Uh, it's a decision tree. Um, the code is there actually to make predictions because we've essentially validated and we've determined that it's pretty accurate. And so this model could be used by anyone out in the field in Gas Bay or in your backyard to determine what irises you have growing around. Um, so it's written in it's what we'll call pure Python. So we're not invoking any particular um, Keras or uh, scikit-learn modules. These, this is all pure Python. There's also a version that's all pure R. Um, so it's trained on 100, 105 flowers, and it was tested on a set of 45. So you could adopt this code uh, for almost anything where you're doing classifications. Um, it, it's a general one. It, it, it uses the gene index, which is a, a valid method for assessing things and assessing um, cost functions. Um, and as I said, if you are more comfortable in R, you can go to um, the, the website, which has the R, uh, R code uh, written out. Uh, but as I say, we'll be doing everything in Python just as, a, as the illustration and to highlight just what's, uh, what's being done algorithmically. 